Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Uh, excited to, uh, to kick off day two of the summit. Um, and thanks, Matt, for the fantastic uh, opening this morning. And thanks, everyone, who joined us yesterday, both in, in uh, North America, where we had about 4,000 or so in the opening session and uh, big numbers through the day. We also had an amazing uh, evening in APAC, if you can call it evening. I don't know. Time is strange. We had uh, something like 700 people joining through APAC and a big number through uh, Europe as well this morning. So very much a global experience. Um, this session, uh, this is the opening keynote day two, and uh, it, it, the title is also the, the theme. It's also the theme of the summit itself, um, which is build a better normal. And uh, I, I wanted to, to have this session as kind of a, a, real, a really provocative session to, to really challenge ourselves to think further and think bigger. And there's no question that uh, 2020 obviously has been deeply tragic and deeply difficult for many, many, many people and continues to be, and it's been a hard year, but it's also um, a time when, when much, much, much more profound change can ever happen than any other time, maybe in the last hundred years. Like if you're, if you're a, a change agent, if you're passionate about making the world a better place, this may be the year you can have a bigger impact than any other time in your entire life. Um, so I just throw that out there. It's difficult, but for some reason, we can do bigger things than ever. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. And I'll give you a little bit of the science of why that is in a moment too. But before that, let me introduce the panel. We have some esteemed guests. We have uh, Dr. Camilla Sip, who's our uh, Director of Neuroscience Research. She'll be sharing some of the deeper science in the session today. Welcome, Cami. Hi, David. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks Pleasure. for joining us today. We have Angel Franklin, who's the Head of Talent at uh, Cummins, which is a large industrial organization, I think about 70,000 people. So you've been, you've been through some challenges this year with people all, uh, all, all around the place. So welcome, Angel. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It's been a wild year. <laughs> it has, hasn't it? And I don't know if any of you have heard of a little company called Netflix, but uh, uh, personally, they saved my life this year, probably many of you as well. Um, and we've got Bex Port, who's the uh, global head of talent for Netflix. Welcome, Bex. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. It's great to have you with us, and please keep keep Netflix running. We all uh, we all uh, have that desire, and the same for the next guest, Lynn Olin from, from Zoom, the uh, Chief Human Resource Officer from Zoom. Lynn, please keep Zoom running as well, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Great to have you. Yes, thank you, David. This is great, and we we actually have Dean with us. A funny story about Dean: he's the CHRO of Patagonia, and we've worked with him and the organization for a number of years. And Patagonia, I don't know if you follow them, they're always or often ahead of the curve. And last year, he made us actually bring him in virtually because of some travel challenges. And this year, he couldn't even do that because of some other crazy challenges. So we've actually got him on video um, presenting a couple of very specific comments. And I wanted to include that because one of the big ideas in the session actually came from him and work they're doing at Patagonia. So we'll, we actually have some snippets from Dean. He's not with us live, but we recorded something just in the last week or two. So let's dig in. I made a bold statement that this might be the year, if you're passionate about you know, creating change in the world, this might be the year that you can have a bigger impact than any other time. Why, why is that? Well, let's, and maybe this is hopeful, I'm going to knock on wood, but this is hopefully a once in a hundred year event when things are very, very, very different. Um, and the, the, the way things are different and the structure of that difference actually allows for bigger changes than any other time. Now, certainly the, um, <laughs> the, the people who study pandemics might say, oh, it could happen again. Let's just put that aside for now. But certainly for the last hundred years, we know for a fact, this is the biggest event in human history that kind of opens up the possibility of change in our organizations in particular. Nothing's come along like this before. Now, why is that? Well, <clears throat> it turns out we, we heard this from Elliot Berkman, one of the scientists we work with a lot, from University of Oregon, we heard this yesterday from him that when people go through changes, they're actually open to a lot more changes. And it's interesting that like, you know, if you move cities, for example, you're more open to starting a you know, new relationship, or if you <clears throat> start a new job, you're more open to, to actually getting a new house. And kind of when some systems shift, you're more open to other systems shifting as well. So there's that. There's also the incredible emotions everyone has felt this year, right? The incredible uh, challenges and struggles that we've had that have just kind of left us 
uh, you know, vulnerable, not, well, I guess vulnerable, but also just open to other ideas. Like we're kind of hungry for different ways of living, different ways of working. In fact, I saw some data from Just Capital. We follow them a bit, some great data. They found at one point, um, I think it was 98% of Americans uh, thought companies should reinvent in this time, which is effectively everyone. Um, and uh, so, so people are really wanting things to be different right now. In fact, we took a poll of uh, about 400 and was it 425 people a few months back. We found that the, the, the magic people wanted to maintain was particularly um, uh, a respect for human needs. That's, that 71% of people said that the magic they want to maintain out of this was a deep respect for human needs. So people are really feeling this like opportunity to do things differently. There's another factor that's quite important, which is that for the, and this is really relevant to the last uh, 100 years point, is that our people practices are uniquely unfrozen. Like when you basically say, hey folks, you now work from home um, or can or may do or all this. And by the way, we don't even know if we have an office anymore. And by the way, we don't know if all these practices ever happen again. Everything's up in the air. And that's very, very rare. And when things are up in the air and sort of unfrozen, they don't have to land back where they were. Whereas you can't kind of repeat this experience of getting everyone to sort of loosen up how they think about you know, all these different practices. So right now, huge numbers of, of talent practices, people practices are just literally unfrozen. So we can do really different things. So, you know, we, we put all this together and we say, you know, if you're passionate about human change, this may be your year. And as difficult as it is to kind of, you know, get past some of the challenges that we have, uh, we really do think that this could be your year to, to really make a big difference. And I'm excited to hear from you folks in a, in, a, in a minute about both on the, you know, audience out there as well as the panelists about kind of what you have been doing. First of all, I want to put a question to you. And the question is, how do we define better? <laughs> Um, so it's really interesting, right? Because you, you sort of don't want to get into, you know, political situations here. You don't want to get into value statements. You don't want to get into like, you know, capitalism versus socialism, all these things. So how do we define better? And so I was thinking about this and I was sort of like, how, how do we strip it right, right, right back? And where, where we landed was actually even, let's even ignore the human brain for a minute. Let's actually put aside neuroscience. I know, weird, right? And let's actually think about just physics, like physics principles, like the stars and the planet and the, you know, the physics of the world. And it turns out that there is a really simple way of thinking about what makes you know, a system, any kind of system better. And in particular in the way humans interact with it. And essentially there are four ways that humans interact with different you know, physical systems. And I, what I mean by that is like agriculture um, or energy production, right? Or mining, or a built environment like cities or how we run organizations, like any kind of physical system, there are four different ways that we can actually interact with that system. And here they are. The first one is we can exploit that system, which means literally, you know, let's say if it's agriculture, get everything we possibly can out of it, not care about how we degrade the, the soil, put chemicals in, do whatever, right? We just exploit it, right? In our companies, those practices are mostly not happening, right? There are, there's legislation that says you can't actually harm people, right? You can't just destroy people's physical well-being or all of that. So, but you know, there was a time where that was this, the, the way we, the organizations worked, right? In hundreds of years ago and maybe some places now. Depletive, depletive approach is, is sort of, you know, government has regulated, you can't do those bad things, but essentially you're leaving a system worse off than you found it, right? So a depletive practice in agriculture is, you know, every year that you farm, the soil gets worse, right? But you're not fully exploiting it, you're doing some things. Or with humans, you know, every year that people work in your company, they're kind of more and more beaten down and tired and exhausted. Um, a sustainable practice means that you're neutral, right? So if it's a, a mine, for example, you're, you know, you're digging a mine, but you're then also, as you finish that, putting plants back in and, you know, 10 years later, it's actually back to what it was. So, you know, it's neutralized, right? Sustainable. The really interesting one is regenerative. And regenerative is a practice across any domain where essentially you're leaving the system better than you found it, right? Let me think about that for a minute, right? You're, you're actually interacting with that system in a physical way and the system is better because of it. So in agriculture, you're going in and, and starting to farm something and every year the land actually gets richer and more, com more complex and greater nutrients and producing more, right? If it's a, if it's a, 
uh, you know, if it's city, the city is getting healthier and more connected and, and better. And if it's an organization, people are actually getting smarter and happier and better off and more successful in all sorts of interesting ways. So that's regenerative. And this is something that, that Dean Carter actually introduced to us. Um, it's something that they've been really thinking about deeply at Patagonia. Um, and he's been, he's been talking about it for a while. We actually ran a podcast with him maybe a year ago, one of the early ones. Um, if you haven't listened to him talking about this idea in detail, I really encourage you to check that out after the summit. Uh, it's in our podcast list. Maybe one of our team can put it in the chat on the platform. Uh, but a powerful idea. Uh, and, and this is something I just wanted to hear from Dean for a minute. Um, let's go to the clip from Dean and we'll, we'll hear what he has to say about this. Uh, over to you. Uh, let's see what Dean has to say. When I think about kind of what, what is our strategy for, for next and what are we going to do? I think we've, in, in many ways, we've doubled down on what we know, um, whether that is how can we, you know, make sure people are engaged or do surveys to connect with them. But I think it's really important to understand at the end, what are we trying to do? And, and not just how we can, I don't know, um, get people re-engaged or make sure they are sustaining whatever it is through this, but how can we understand what has been, um, what has been taken out of people's lives in this moment um, and what is being put back in? And there's a lot of puts and takes that are happening and there's a lot of things um, that we can focus on and what we can actually measure to understand kind of what is, what is the balance that we're putting into people's lives in, in regenerative ways, not just kind of what has been taken out, but what are the things that result of this that we can, uh, that we can put back in? Fantastic. We're so happy to have Dean's uh, perspective with us. And as he said, like, we're taking a lot out of people this year, aren't we? More than ever. Uh, and, and how are we going to balance that out with inputs? How are we going to put even more back in? Um, and that's kind of what this session is about in many ways. How do we like understand what people really need and actually put those things back in and also do that not just for 2020 and dare I say it, 2021, but actually for the way we run organizations now? How do we create these regenerative you know, practices overall? Um, really, really important. And um, finally, you know, the, the question maybe on, on, you know, business leaders' minds is why should we care? Well, you know, here it is in a graph. Um, this is companies that really care about humans a lot. It's the best metric we could find from Just Capital. Um, it's not perfect. We might do it differently. But from our perspective, the, the Just 100, which is a, a selection of companies that really think about human needs, is probably the best metric we've seen for companies that are, we would think of as the most human um, and kind of respecting human needs. And it turns out they dramatically outperform the market and even through this time, uh, actually really outperformed the market as well. So, you know, so there it is. Um, so that's, you know, kind of a preamble and maybe went a little bit long, but um, I, I think, you know, what we wanna, you know, what we wanna do is think really big. Uh, so I challenge all the, the audience out there to think really big with your comments, your chats, your, your insights, you know, throw them in the chat as it happens. Think really big about how do we, create a regenerative or, you know, it's planet really in terms of organizations um, and, and what do we need to do? So let's turn to Cami to start off with kind of what are the critical inputs and in classic NLI style, we're not going to tell you everything that everyone needs all the time. We're going to say, what are the things that seem to matter most that we need to care about as inputs, right? So um, what, what really matters most outside of people being, you know, fed and safe, um, what do people really need if these organizations are going to be regenerative? So, Cami, over to you. Uh, take us away. Absolutely. Thank you, David. So, as you've mentioned, I think that the knowing that 70% or around 70% wants to of organizations wants to carry on with the human or psychological needs that we should be paying much more attention. This year actually exposed the main three needs that we have. The, the, the first one is about connection and actually tested it in quite a significant way. As you can see here in the, in the image, the idea of us being in a park with other people and hanging out, and it seems like such a luxury nowadays that we are longing for that. And when you mentioned uh, bags and Netflix saving our lives, I felt months into the pandemic that I every few weeks I have a new network event with a new show that I was watching and new friends getting to know which was quite of an interesting interesting idea that was that was shaping up but 
the main challenge, and it's a little bit of a dark side, is that what we've experienced is actually a lot of loneliness. And the loneliness, the, the research that uh, led by late John uh, Cachopo and many others show that loneliness is actually much bigger. The, the things that are under the surface, it's not just that we are sad and we feel like we don't have enough uh, interaction, but there are actually consequences for of loneliness that are much more uh, spread out. And that leads essentially uh, social isolation and, and feeling lonely seems to be much more dangerous sometimes than smoking or diabetes when it comes to uh, physiological impact. And especially when we think about not the one weekend alone, but the months and months and months alone and prolonged loneliness leads to several different cascading effects from increased stress level to reduce sleep quality, major executive function, meaning we have actually impaired way of thinking and, and self-regulating, but also major factors that range from uh, increased chances of disease, disability, poor health, but also even death. And the reason why the consequences are so profound is that when we feel isolated, when we have this acute isolation, we actually shift the brain into the self-preservation mode for a reason from an evolutionary standpoint that was needed when we were lost in the wild wilderness for a short period of time, there was a whole set of system that was designed to help us move out of that acute state. So from, from feeling this acute, uh, acute and quite increased social pain that, that we, that we uh, felt from uh, as a function of being excluded or being out from, from our community to fragmented sleep, to reduce immunity, but also to diminish self-control uh, that allowed us to jump out and do things that are much easier for us to move to another state and leave the, the woods or the savanna or, or, or the wilderness whenever whatever we were uh, um, finding ourselves in. The challenge is that if this state is prolonged as what we're experiencing right now, it actually is quite detrimental, as we've just mentioned, and what we've observed across the globe, not only in North America, but these are uh, studies and, and data from North America, is that anxiety and depression have actually skyrocketed in the last few months between March and September of this year, which is only about six months. You can see that a whopping over 600 some more uh, percentage, more searches for online uh, help about anxiety and figuring out what what do I have anxiety? How how do I cope with anxiety? And nearly 900 uh, percent increase in searches about depression, which the impact of that on a workforce and how how the population in general is going to be to be working and and, and thinking more effectively is going to be quite long term. And I know that this is the dark, the dark side, I, I want to make sure that we lift up. And when we think actually, the one thing that we've noticed in our research is that being a part of a team, even in this acute state of stress is actually quite helpful to mitigate the stress. So what we've learned actually is that leaders and organizations that are doubling down on creating inclusive teams are actually making the workforce more um, prepared to sustain the prolonged uh, state of crisis or loneliness or uh, as we go out from this, as David mentioned, we can actually go into 21 into this and fingers crossed that's going to be shorter, a <laughs> shorter uh, time in 21 than what we've experienced in, in 2020. Great. Thanks, Kami. That's so great. Um, so here's a question for the audience and then we'll, 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 um, we'll go to the panel in a moment. The question for the audience is kind of looking back before we look forward. I, I want to talk to the panelists about looking forward in a moment, but looking back, um, what really inspired you that your company did or you saw another organization did around staying connected, around maintaining those human connections? Like what were some of the activities that happened or some of the things you tried? Was it the, the Friday quarantini that became, you know, uncancelable no matter what? Was it the, uh, you know, what were some of the things that really inspired you that you saw either in your company or in other companies that, um, that you saw? So let's get those in the chat. And then the, the, the panelists will, um, you know, we'll all kind of take a look at those. We may comment on some, but we're going to sort of focus on uh, a little bit on going forward as well. Take a moment to put some comments in the chat. We'll, uh, we'll see what's, uh, what's coming in. Give you a moment to put those in. <clears throat> some of my favorites, um, you know, the socially distant picnic, the company picnic where you had, you know, hundreds of people, but they literally were, you know, eight feet apart, everyone and outside and still kind of getting together and feeling togetherness. Um, 
was a wonderful thing. There was a lot of really inspiring um, kind of very non-professional uh, kind of just fun things that we saw companies doing. Um, you know, people taking folks around their home and, you know, actually showing them their pets and their kids and their chaos uh, and really sort of letting people into the humanity was really, uh, you know, really moving. I think something we, you know, we saw a lot. Um, what are some of the things coming in? Let's get some of those from the platform. And uh, anything, uh, Bex, Lynn, Angel, anything that you guys saw that was really inspiring, kind of the things that really moved you the most? While we wait for those to come in on the chat. We did something, David, um, early on. Um, we called it connecting conversations because we realized we've grown so fast and furiously. A lot of our managers are first time managers um, and they were experiencing this themselves while having to lift up their teams. And, and so we doubled down on teams and we took intact teams through um, a program called Connecting Conversations and it gave them an opportunity to have, you know, let their hair down, um, let their guards down and really, you know, give, um, way to real conversation, not just work, right? So we're, we're moving hard, we're, we're fast, we're, we're charging hard. And sometimes we forget the, the part that, that really matters, right? So we really ramped up on something that would get that, you know, at the forefront of the conversation. Yeah, nice. I mean, one of the things that we did uh, that, that we've been encouraging everyone to do, I, I think I've got a blog coming out on this, just like every stand-up meeting, every like weekly meeting where you're sort of checking in, you know, if you have enough time, get allocate time, but literally ask everyone and make them answer the question, how are you? And actually mean it. So, you know, how are you, first of all? Secondly, you know, have you been winning this week? And thirdly, what do you need help with? So a much more kind of human um, interaction than we've ever, ever had before. Like asking how are you and actually caring and actually listening. Um, and then really, you know, enabling leaders to, to have that as well. We're seeing some good comments coming in. I mean, the weekly uh, team meetings for people where things are much more, uh, you know, much more human, the, the socially distanced drive-in movie night, that's really fun. There's the care packages sent to, uh, uh, sent to people, the uh, virtual visits with pets, that's fantastic. Um, a Friday gong ceremony, congratulating team members with major accomplishments. So there's, there's lots that, that, you know, lots that was inspiring. Uh, Angel or Bex, anything you want to add in there? Yeah, we, we did something similar at Cummins. We, we call it um, head, heart, and hands. And we just, every time we start a meeting, we ask, you know, what's on your mind? Um, so what's distracting you? What's in your heart? How are you feeling? And then what distractions are really uh, taking over you today so that you really can have a, just a much more human connection. And we constantly hear people just feel generally safer when they're able to say that because whatever's going on for them, they feel they have a platform to say that uh, safely and, and can just share and not feel like they've got to hold that in. Right, that's nice. Head, heart, and hands, fantastic. Um, it's a, uh, you know, uh, Bex, did you want to add something? Yeah, we did something that's called the inside scoop. So at the start of every meeting, a different person takes 10 minutes or so to present on the, the, the brief is what's important to you. And that just gave us all an insight into each other's lives. So I've got people who in their spare time ride Harley Davidson's, didn't know that, um, learning more about people's families. And it's a slide presentation with a series of um, uh, uh, pictures in it. And I was just really surprised as to how impactful that was and the deeper connections that it actually built. But I think overall as a company, mm -hmm thing that for me was most inspiring was just the consistency around our messaging of mm. the you matter, your family matters, your life matters in terms of how we um, want to support you in all of that you're dealing with. And that while everybody is in a global pandemic, everybody's experience is different and that everybody should take the time to do what they need to, to balance work and life. And I've never seen an organization or, and I know many organizations did it, but it certainly was a shift in messaging. And I think the consistent drumbeat of that messaging was actually what most people felt right. connected to and felt inspired by. Right. No, it's really good. Just, just like we, we want you to take care of yourselves, whatever that looks like. And we know that's going to be really variable um, and, and do whatever that takes and consistently. That's great. Lynn, do you want to add something there? I was just going to say that we're, we're one of the things we're going to do this month is switch it up a little bit since this is the month of Thanksgiving. 
and we're going to do bite-sized gratitude because even though we're in this horrible space, there are silver linings and we want to make sure people are thinking about that as well. Yeah, no, definitely. That's nice. Gratitude is a wonderful, is a wonderful thing. Let's go to the, the sort of big question here. And this is where I want to kind of lift all of us up a little, sort of challenge us a little bit. Um, how do we build like this, this, and when I say this, I mean this, this, it's really a respect that people need to feel connected. Right. I mean, and it's not just, you know, if, if we stay virtual for a long time, even if we don't, um, how do we use this moment? How do we leverage this moment to respect that connectedness is as important as like a, it's actually more important than a good diet, by the way. In fact, you, I don't know if you know this, but you, you actually will live longer and don't take this out of context. You'll live longer as a heavy drinker than a non-drinker because of the social benefits, because you actually feel connected to people. Um, although you'll live lightest, uh, longest as a light drinker. Than a non drinker, but it, like it literally is more important than than you know diet, exercise, all these other things that we feel connected. So how do we build this like real respect for humans needing to feel connected into a better normal? That's my challenge for you, like uh, in your organizations, but also in all organizations. What are some of the ideas you have, Bex? Do you want to go first? What's what kind of jumps out for you? Yeah, look, I, I think some of it is really hammering it home. And, you know, I'm delighted that connection is as important as is going to uh, mitigate against my drinking of, of wine. So, <laughs> that's, you know, I think ensuring that people are aware of this, you know, as we look at models of leadership and we look at what makes a great leader, really taking the time to understand people as complex, multifaceted human beings and really taking the time to understand um, people's lives and what's mm. important to them and what's going on and what they challenge and really building that into models of leadership. Right. I do think one of the challenges that we're going to face is as we return to the workforce, we're going to have a hybrid workforce. Yep. So I think it's really easy to be compassionate and empathic when everybody is faced with a similar situation. Now, obviously, like I said, the experiences of um, COVID have been different for different people. But it's much easier to have empathy when you're going through something similar. Um, and I think as we go back to the workplace, you know, there will be a challenge mm. around connectedness and that some people will feel much more connected right. because they're in the office and they've got these informal coffees and things like that and versus those people that are at home. Right. We could get a and real so divide there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's almost a sort of a connectedness um, advantage that people are going to have. And so I just think mm. that we need to really focus on the events where we do bring people together. So all hands, team off sites, mm. and really focusing them around the opportunity to connect. And it's sort of having those either bi-yearly or quarterly meetings where people can regenerate. And then that sustains them over the next quarter or the next six months. But I right. think without some of that actual physical connection, it's going to be difficult. And I think no, that's interesting. I, what, that's really interesting. Sorry, I want to comment on the first point and uh, sorry, cut you off the, 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 the first point that it's almost like we need to institutionalize like the lack of covering, right? Like let people be themselves, but find ways to institutionalize, put that in the system, right? <clears throat> and I, I know, I think at Splunk, they were, um, the folks over there we've worked with on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, they, they put in this like way of introducing yourselves at Splunk, which is you tell the whole story when you introduce yourself, you know, of all the things that you, who you are and what you're made up of all this stuff. And it's a lot of it would be like, you know, TMI for some companies, but all yeah. of it, and, but actually institutionalizing that everyone doing that CEO down. So there's something around that I think would be really powerful. So kind of things are out in the open, you're taking away the covering. And then it's a really interesting point about the divide. It could be a big divide between people who maybe have to work at home or really want to, uh, and then people in the office. And we advised years ago, we advised a number of companies, including BlackRock, who did this, uh, that, you know, the best rule to have is if you have anyone out of the room, then everyone's out of the room. Um, it's a really good rule. If anyone's out of the room, everyone's on a platform. Um, and if you're not using platforms all the time, you'll probably use them really well because you're less sick of them. Um, but I, I personally think that's a really important rule. To, to make sure that divide doesn't happen. Because as soon as you start feeling like you're really not included in those meetings, just because you can't hear as well, it's, you know, it's going to be an issue. Um, Angel, do you want to go next? What do you think? How do we build this sort of acceptance of, um, you know, connectedness really, really matters? Uh, how do we build this into our organizations? What do you think? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this, you know, vulnerability and role modeling from leadership is huge. And so some of the things that we've begun to do um, is we, we launched a campaign called It's Okay. And it really was just like, you're feeling sad, happy, optimistic, depressed. There's this range of emotions that you're feeling and all of those things and the highs and lows that you're feeling are all allowed. So our CEO actually talked about his mental health and wellness journey and, and his daughter having anxiety. And we've had a number of different leaders in the company just share their mental health and wellness journeys. It, it, the way that people have responded has just been tremendous wow. because it's created this huge degree of safety. And now, um, you know, people have talked about it, not just connected to the pandemic, but just overall in their lives. And so it's so uh, a little bit connected to what Beck said, um, you know, we all have this shared, you know, this empathy, we've had this shared experience, but it's, it's opening the door to have these more deeper conversations where people are saying, actually, I went through depression a year ago. Here's what it looked like for me. My child is struggling with ADHD and anxiety. Here's what it looks like for me. And so people are getting more help. Uh, you know, we're seeing better usage of our EAP. Um, people are, are being able to raise issues and, and, and make progress. And so they're not kind of constantly under threat right. anymore because they feel safer. That's really nice. Thank you. So, so like really institutionalize, if I, maybe it's an awful word, but kind of systemize maybe that mental health issues are out in the open, you know, from the top down and, and really openly discuss. They're sort of taboo in some ways in this country, other countries less so, but um, sort of making it, making it really okay from the top down to actually have those things, uh, have those things handled. Lynn, do you want to weigh in there as well on kind of how do we, well, I, mean, I, would, the ideas? I would echo yeah. a lot of what I've heard because leading with empathy is going to be critical uh, going forward to, to ensure um, that we all feel you know, connected. The other thing is, you know, one of the stories I'll tell vis-a-vis -vis Zoom is we have this whole volunteer force. Um, it's called the Happy Crew. And they are very much, um, th this is uh, building on what Beck said, they're very much tied to a location. Um, so they've had to rethink themselves and think about how in, in maybe a hybrid work space. They won't necessarily just run a coffee cart in San Jose. We have to think about how we're going to broaden that out. Um, and we've been hiring like crazy. I mean, the, the numbers are staggering, but we're about a third of our workforce now in the new, never seen an office, never, never experienced wow. Zoom from an office. So if you think about that, that is a, the new normal, right? So we have to we have to adapt, we have to change, and we have to make all those people um, feel included too, feel mm -hmm. that the way we felt before all of this. So it's a it's a challenge, and we're we're doing you know different things, but the even the volunteer crew is coming up with ways to to think that right. through, and I think that's, that's great. great. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. So so if we think about making organizations that um, that leave people better than we found them, right? That's regenerative. As we think about making organizations that literally leave people better than we found them, you know, we need to we need to up our game around relatedness. We need around connectedness, around feeling you know other humans are around us in some ways, and that we're connected to them. So we need to you know clearly up our game. These are some great ideas. There's some more great ideas coming in the chat. Please drop those in the chat as you have insights. Drop those in. But let's go to chapter two. Let's talk more about a second need. So if we need to feel connected, there's another need that's really deep and primary in the brain um, that we need to actually be putting back into these systems um, to make sure people are actually fed uh, in, a, in, a, in a cognitive sense. So Cami, tell, uh, tell us about this one. Yes, absolutely. And, and one thing that I wanted to also comment on, on the discussion is that when we're creating this connectedness or connection for our workforce, it's important to do it within the working hours, not to put something like, let's meet at 6 p.m., those groups, working moms, to make sure that actually the connection is, is within the simulating the work uh, workforce that, that we've experienced in the past to, to feed that connection. As David, as you mentioned, the, the second need that took a lot of beating this year for all of us is our need for our need to know, our need for certainty, and we've learned that actually quite uh, profoundly um, uh, in across a whole host of research, including our own, that certainty matters a lot for us. Knowing, having the enough information or having this, the sense that we have enough information, enough data, allows us to feel not only more confident in our organization, uh, staying afloat through the crisis, but also about us making sure that we are actually having enough information to predict the outcomes. For us as human, as human beings, predictability of what I can expect 
next uh, is actually extremely not only rewarding, but also it gives us a sense of uh, uh, security. And in many ways, in general, even when we are not overwhelmed, like uh, let's assume we are talking about uh, last year, this, the need for certainty has always been one of the primary need that we have. And in this year, when we are so overwhelmed, so stressed, and we are dealing with so much uh, heightened uncertainty, combining that with the ambiguity of not necessarily knowing how to read some of the information, which, which news outlet we should rely on, what information we should be we, we should be sharing with our workforce, creates actually a compounding effect that we tend to go with the negative bias, meaning that we are going to be paying attention and looking for the negativity in the information that we are receiving rather than the positivity. And there is a, there is a whole host of uh, studies. One of the studies that actually talks about this ambiguity and the negative bias is one that uh, researchers just ask people to, to uh, assign a label for emotional affect of faces, meaning is this person happy, sad, uh, upset? And majority of the times we are fairly fast to, uh, to assess the, the emotion fairly accurately the challenge happens when the the face is actually neutral just like this gentleman on the right side a lot of the times when that happens we not only take much longer to decide what this person is potentially feeling and what uh, what is the emotion that they might be expressing but we actually tend to go negative we we, we tend to say he's upset he looks like he's angry and some, some of you might be looking at this image and thinking, yeah, he looks kind of angry. And others may be thinking, looking, yeah, well, he's neutral. He doesn't show anything. And the, the challenge for us is that that actually tra will translate into how we are perceiving the information that we are getting from, from our leaders. And the other aspect that actually Bex mentioned already in terms of re, uh, uh, delivering as much information to the workforce as, as you have available, is one of the really important uh, challenges right now that we have. And David, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, what we are, what we mean by this is actually thinking about the this disconnect between leadership and workforce in terms of how much transparency workforce actually is experiencing. Leaders tend to think that we are very transparent in the information that we trickle down the pike, but when when we actually reverse that and we ask the workforce. What we found out in our research is that only about 37% agreed that the decision making and information is transparent, which means that there is quite of a gap between what we think we are doing top down to what happens bottom up. And one way of actually mitigating that is instead of thinking that I need to provide certainty or I don't have the information to give, so I'm going to hold on before I have the information to release to the workforce, as organizations and leadership, we can actually think about providing clarity, even about the fact that we don't have the data yet, or we don't have the specific answer yet. So anchoring on clarity over certainty would actually benefit uh, in terms of satisfying the psychological need for us for certainty, because we can actually give some nuggets of information, some data, and put our brains a little bit at ease that, okay, I'm going to learn this in a week. I may not mm. have the information right now. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a thing called the Zaganic effect. We've known for for a long time that that essentially the the layperson's term the understanding of this is you know open loops keep getting attention. Like mm -hmm. um, if you if you haven't finished a you know the, the last word on a crossword puzzle, right? And you just got that last word, like it keeps coming into mind. And and anything that's an open loop gets priority attention in the brain. It's kind of an incomplete intention. So in any kind of incomplete goal is the same. And in an incomplete goal you haven't achieved yet keeps getting attention. And and so what's happening with, you know, with uncertainty is the, you know, uncertainty has been awful this year. It's been, it's been impossible. And it's really easy to say, well, we can't do anything about it because everything's uncertain. But if you can just give the brain like anything that helps it close that loop, right, it actually calms down. And uh, that's actually really important because the, the level of, of uh, threat response people were experiencing was, you know, way too high to just get even decent work done. Uh, we're going to hear more about that. We've got um, the scientist uh, who, who we based our work on, on three levels of threat uh, joining us, uh, one of the sessions coming up after this um, on focus during crisis, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Mobs. And uh, it's fascinating, He's, he'll talk through the three levels of threat, but people at that like middle level of threat, which is sort of all of us <laughs> most of the year, just do terrible work. Um, it's very shallow work, very shallow thinking, very reactive, 
So anything that can bring us back to even just a manageable threat level, that level one threat, um, where we, we actually can be alert and productive is really helpful. Small things can matter a lot. And so we were thinking a lot about um, sort of hammering home that clarity can really help. Um, and I started to sort of mull over sort of how to, how to bring this alive. And we, we started to see a pattern uh, as we do it in a lie and, and, and saw essentially kind of three general themes emerging for how to create clarity. And this has been a useful framework um, to kind of think about clarity and, and, and how to actually develop it. And so one of the ways you can create clarity, again, not certainty, but clarity, um, is essentially taking things off the table. And this is a little counterintuitive because some of those things you take off the table are kind of bad news, like, oh, sorry. But removing options and kind of removing alternatives um, is, it can be very, very, very uh, helpful because it reduces ambiguity. Um, in fact, the, I think it was uh, Winston Churchill said, the absence of alternatives clears the mind marvelously. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it's, it's kind of reducing possibilities. And Microsoft's done a pretty good job with this uh, back in March. Uh, they said, you know what, all in-person conferences, events, everything is, are out until July next year. They were very prescient with that. Uh, they recently said, you know what, if you want to work from home, you can do that forever. Uh, we're never going to force you to come back. Um, it's, very, it's a very big statement, very bold statement, but it created a lot of clarity for people. Um, but if you can't do that, maybe you can say like, you know what, there's going to be no decisions about where and when you work and all that till say June next year. There's going to be absolutely no decisions made. And even when we make one, we're going to give you at least three months warning or something like that, right? So the clarity from that is really powerful. And it's, it's sort of non-intuitive because some of those things might be bad news. Like, you know, no pay rises for a year. Definitely not absolutely happening. Now people can stop wondering. Um, and strangely enough, after they get over the shock, a week later, people are actually better because they have less ambiguity. So even if it's bad news, giving them that bad news often reduces a whole lot of ambiguity and makes things better. The second thing is articulating timelines and the, the better governments who've been managing this, uh, you know, federal and state globally have done a good job with this one of, you know, here's, here's what the timeline looks like and here are the, the principles we're working with. Um, so we started talking about this early on in the pandemic that we're all in a shock phase, like we've fallen down, broken our leg, just running on adrenaline, you know, can't really think yet you know, hasn't hit in. And, and at some point the pain will kick in and then eventually we'll rehabilitate. Right now, we're all as a society in that pain stage that seems to go on forever. Um, and so, you know, there are these three stages, shock, pain, rehabilitation. Um, and just sort of noticing that helps you make sense of the world, increases your sense of clarity, right? So anything that, even if it's very high level, uh, it helps, even if it's very, very high level can help you actually feel more certain as you were able to understand the different stages. So timelining things down to, you know, from, from timelining what things are gonna look like over the next few weeks, all the way up to, you know, this is probably what we'll do for the next two years as a company um, can, can really, really help. And then the third one here is, is a bit more subtle, but the third one is quite powerful is, um, is, is actually coming back to a set of principles. Um, and uh, we heard those last night, we had the CEO of one of the biggest banks in, uh, in, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, ANZ Bank, he was talking about what they did, you know, one of their principles, you know, was, was protect the bank, you know, take care of, another one was, you know, take care of customers and the other one was take care of each other. They had, you know, three really simple principles that they wanted everyone to just go and act on. And when you define a clear set of principles, you've got this sort of strange attractor or kind of true north to always come back to. And the simpler they are in many ways, the better. Uh, but coming back to a small set of principles that really, really matter uh, can help you tremendously. So let's uh, let's dig into that a bit. Let's uh, so so folks online definitely um, you know love to hear your your insights about this or questions. But I, I want to go to the panel. Um, we might stop sharing for a bit as well. So my my question for the panel is how do we kind of take this seriously again as a human need? How do we take this need for uh, you know certainty? Uh, which we may have to only give them clarity, right? But how do we take this need for certainty more seriously in a better normal? And not just, you know, through again, 2020, 2021, but how do we like really reinvent our companies so that this stuff is taken really seriously? What comes up? Lynn, do you want to go first? I, I mean, transparency is you, the, those three principles are right on. I mean, we've created uh, the, the principles around how we're going to work through right now. Um, and I think that's something that we have to carry into the new new normal. 
Um, we can't just say this is for the pandemic and, and um, we'll, we'll go back to the way we were beforehand. I think the idea that you know, we created the principles. We won't go back in the office till there's PP, you know, we can't wear PPE. We, we, if you move temporarily, you won't have a pay. Uh, we've done all of that, but still there's uncertainty. And, and I, I felt it in a conversation I had this week with a, a young man who was a brand new employee who said, I was hired for the Denver office. I'm living in Oklahoma in my parents' basement. W what do I do? I wanna keep my life going. And, and I felt for him, I really felt for him. And I thought we had done all of that. So I, I think, you know, doing that even more extremely in terms of being transparent and then not forgetting that when this is all over. I think that's critical to the, to the new normal. That's great. Yeah, no, it's uh, some really, you know, incredible stories happening out there. Angel, what about for you? What's, you know, how do you think we can build this, this, this human need into the, the structures and process of our organization or what comes up for you? Yeah, I think one thing is leaders really have to get comfortable, um, you know, I guess, being uncomfortable. They have to be able to say the hard things. And I think one of the things that's happened for us during this time is, you know, we, we did pay cuts across the organization for our people. And we told them and we promised we're not going to do mass layoffs. We're not, the pay cuts are going to end on this day. You're going to know exactly when you, when you, you know, when that's being reinstated. And it was, and it's similar to what you said, um, David, that, you know, people felt a sense of clarity and they, in our stock price hit a record high eventually people we didn't lose people there was great you know loyalty i think in the company the the other thing we had to do also though is we had to give people space to ask questions and, and to ask us uncomfortable questions um and so we did sessions with um, our medical staff around you know how we were making decisions to keep our offices open or not we are critical infrastructure so we had some people that were in manufacturing plants other people working from home uh, that created discomfort. And we talked about each decision we were making. And so there was this kind of uh, radical transparency, but there was also this really, it's okay to be uncomfortable. This is hard, but we're going to tell you the truth and we're going to give you space to ask the questions you need to ask. Yeah, I know that's great. So making leaders comfortable with being uncomfortable, that's a, that's a big one, isn't it? And so they're, they're, that's the thing with, with, with this clarity issue is you've got to be willing to not have certainty, right? And, and value that actually clarity can go a long way um, and just kind of go with that. And if you're a really concrete kind of person that maybe, maybe you're an engineer or someone you know, really thinks in concrete terms, it can be really uncomfortable to just say, well, look, I don't really know anything, but here's a timeline. But it, it ends up actually being really, really helpful if you can let that go. Bex, you wanna jump in there? Yeah, so at Netflix, we really lean into transparency and this is not a new thing. This is not a, in response to COVID. Um, and, and it works really well. We set context so that it gives people clarity. Um, and there are things in other organizations I've worked at that you would never share or I would have never shared or said, oh, you know, we can't share that information. And at Netflix, we lean into it, including things like open compensation. So you can see what anybody else is paid across the organization. Um, and so I think it's really important for us all to press on transparency and say, why am I not sharing this? Can I share this? And actually sometimes take a bit of a risk with, with sharing and sharing more information and context. It's interesting. We, we actually ran a session some years back. Uh, some, sometimes our summit is like five years ahead of the curve, uh, but we ran the session uh, on radical transparency and um, uh, literally on the concept of like actually everyone having access to everything, right? And there's some famous companies that we've maybe heard of that that actually do that. There's a very famous hedge fund. Um, there's also uh, a company called Qualtrics that maybe some of you use who are a data company. They got bought um, recently, but they, they uh, we had the CEO of Qualtrics, Ryan Smith, talking with us a few years back about the power of uh, actually everyone knowing everything at any time. And they had this system where you could literally sort of press the button and literally listen to anyone's phone call just because everything was stored. And uh, you could see everyone's expense report. You could see how they're paid. You could see all of it. Um, and while it's hard to sort of start with that, um, what, what he found, it was tremendously, tremendously inspiring for people who are, you know, moderate to high performers. Poor performers couldn't deal with it. But the high performers, like, like had all the data they needed to work out how to, like, compete with the top performers. And the sort of, you know, everyone could see what great really, really looked like. Um, and so that's, that's coming up for me, you know, maybe it's a time to bring back the concept of radical transparency um, as a way to institutionalize, like, the, the, the really deep human need for clarity. 
uh, it, there might be more upsides than downsides. It's an, inter it's an interesting perspective. Um, fantastic. Any other closing comments on this before we go to chapter three? We probably should get there. Uh, let's go to chapter three. So we're talking about we're talking about how do we leave these human systems better than we found them. And what we're seeing so far is the need for connectedness has to be addressed. The need for certainty has to be addressed one way or another. Uh, we have to address this hunger for certainty. Um, and there's a third one. I'll just go back to, to sharing screen. Um, and it's, it's an interesting one. And it's, it's, it's something that also plummeted, obviously, in this time. And it's this need for, uh, for, for a sense of control. It's a need for a sense of, uh, you know, what we call uh, autonomy. This feeling like, you know, when you pull a lever, the thing that is supposed to happen, you know, actually happens. It's feeling like you have some control. So, Kami, uh, take us away on this one. Absolutely. Thank you, David. And I think that it's, uh, it, it, what you just mentioned is, is, is quite important, that in the acute stages of, of crisis, what we found out in, in, in our research is was the, the needs, the three primary needs were, were actually certainty, relatedness, and fairness, which connects to the transparency aspect. And right now that we are almost kind of like out of the triage stage when the shock and pain, we kind of got used to the new way of working, the, the, the need for control and the need for autonomy is actually rising up much more to the, to the forefront because humans, as humans, we really want to have a say in what happens to us. Outside of knowing uh, the data, but also understanding that I have a control, I have some sense of control over, over what is going to happen to, to us. And in many ways, we know from a lot of research that just having a choice or perception of a choice, it's actually inherently rewarding, meaning that we feel good when we have a choice. And that translates to even feeling good about a failure, potentially, or assigning a good, um, a positive uh, association to a failure, if the failure or, or a mishap happened as a function of us choosing that option to begin with, instead of us, for example, being told that you need to go with that project and then we fail on that project, most likely we will be quite defensive and, and actually uh, zoom out from, from, from taking responsibility for that failure. But that's not the case when we, when we, when we, when we experience that failure as a fun, as, as a, to the choice that we've made ourselves. So that, that's quite an important connection and the fact that we have the choice is is no, it's very rewarding and it translates to very uh, measurable uh, behaviors in organizations from uh, having much uh, more handle on our work life balance to higher commitment bigger and greater productivity engagement but also the motivation to exert ex uh, discretionary effort even in at times when as angel you mentioned the comp went lower for the, for a short period of time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that our engagement in the organization was also lower because we automatically got some balancing out of the, of the scales when it comes to understanding the bigger uh, landscape of, of which we are working within. And that means for us also that when we actually think about um, working from home and understanding what is happening right now is, is that working from home and the autonomy associated with working from home is actually good for some. And we need to have that in mind. We can see that the numbers are quite high when it comes to the satisfaction. Majority of population of, of, of the workforce that was surveyed actually feel satisfied with working from home. They feel like they have either the same or improved productivity after the first few weeks of upheaval, that, like, you know, the first, the first transition, then we kind of settled down and we actually enjoyed working from home and the productivity doesn't suffer, as well as our chances of actually taking care of our health. And this is really important. And we've actually uh, uh, tested that and asked uh, in, in another survey of our own to see what are the key benefits that people think, uh, think of when it comes to working from home. And that actually was uh, not only where you work from home, the decision and autonomy, but also when. Meaning I don't need to work during my normal work hours when my kids are running havoc during their homeschooling, I can take those two hours off, take care of them and do my two hours, two hours when they go to sleep. So it's quite important that there are, there are measurable benefits. The one thing that we want to make sure that we remember is that we need to remember the remaining 20% of the workforce for whom working from home is not that good. And they do want to come back to, to offices full time because they do feel more energy about for, uh, from collaborating with others. They feel the need for external accountability, meaning other people working and I see other people working. So 
instead of actually looking at my couch and feeling like it's calling me, I'm going to stay on, on, on my calls, on my projects and, and not impact my productivity. And also working from home for those who don't feel comfortable doing that, it's going to be much, much harder to separate the work life from, from life life because the, my projects and, and my working happens at the kitchen table that I'm going to have dinner in a moment. And when we think about the, even though it's potentially 80, 20% split in terms of how workers feel about, feel about uh, working from home, when we think about the autonomy, when we think about control, we've actually also found out that when we ask what would make working from home better if you need to work from home, outside of deciding when and where to work, you can actually see that there is also quite a, quite a, a big need for deciding or having a say in uh, who you collaborate with, meaning what, what are the teams that you're going to join and what projects you are going to join. So that means that for organizations, and David, you, can, you, you will walk us through this, there is, a, there is a consideration that organizations need to make to accommodate for both of those, uh, those who really like working from home and enjoy the autonomy and those who don't, to give them some levers, as David mentioned, to pull on, to give them a little bit more autonomy yeah. and a little bit more uh, certainty for what they can expect. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Cam. It's beautifully said. Thanks. Um, and, you know, there's a, a couple of things to, to say here. I mean, firstly, um, I think even in the 20% of people who say that they're, they're desperate to get back to the office, I think there's actually a mix of people in there. If you sort of pull that apart, there are some people who are actually more productive at home, but just desperately want to get to the office um, because they just miss their friends. They miss like having a different kind of lunch, not having to make their own lunch. They may want to get away from the kids for good reasons, like maintain their sanity. Like there's all sorts of reasons why people actually want to go to the office, not just to be more productive. So they'll, you know, there'll be those people. There'll also be a group of people, maybe, you know, younger career folks, earlier career folks who just don't have the, the, the tools to work at home no matter what. They just don't have the physical space to, to really focus and they don't want to spend their entire life in their bedroom. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a sort of different pockets of people. But I, I do think however you carve it, there's a good number of people that, you know, that want to go back. But actually the majority um, at this point of, you know, finding it good and, you know, definitely the large majority. And I think what we found in this data is that when you sort of give people a little bit of autonomy, they start thinking about other things that they might have autonomy in. Uh, when you give people a little bit of control, uh, they're like, oh, maybe I want to control that. It's a bit like having an app. You know, when you have an app for the weather and you can see what the weather is, now you want to know the traffic. And then when you've got the weather and the traffic, now you want to know, you know, who your friends are and where they are. And when you have that now, so, you know, as you get more control, you think about having more control in other things, right? And that's what's happening. And, and we saw a number of things that um, companies could think about in this time. As, as we think about building a better normal, um, this might be a time to really get uh, much more flexible around um, kind of putting the employee back in charge. Um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of good reasons for that, uh, but I'll just, I, I think autonomy can be a really, really powerful lever for organizations. It's probably the most powerful lever. And, and I mean that like literally in like the thing that you can use that gets the biggest, you know, momentum or the biggest impact as a company. Um, as an executive or a talent leader, or HR exec, like working with autonomy can, can probably give you the most return in terms of reduced stress. And there's, there's a, a couple of reasons for that. Um, the, the, the first one is, and we wrote a paper sort of around this issue, not directly on this. Maybe, Cami, we should do this next year and sort of like dig into this some more. Uh, but we wrote a paper called um, uh, the, uh, around total rewards, the neuroscience of total rewards. And we actually unpacked the way rewards work from a sort of total rewards perspective, like, you know, give people money versus uh, education versus other things. And what we see is that when you give people choice, uh, a whole lot of different things happen at different points in the cycle. And so firstly, when you give someone a choice, firstly, they, they feel respected at the start. They're like, oh, thank you for giving me a choice. You know, they went from low choice to high choice, which is inherently rewarding. Um, so there's this first kind of chunk of just being given a choice that's rewarding in the moment and keeps being rewarding. Secondly, what they choose is much more likely to be intrinsically rewarding than what someone else might choose for them, right? So what an individual chooses is, um, is gonna be more rewarding. Because what we tend to do is we tend to give people things that we would want. You know, if you love, um, you know, if you love nature, you, you're gonna give someone, you know, more time in nature, but they might like the city, you know? So 
it's um it, so so when you give people autonomy, they're much more likely to choose the things that they actually uh, value, right? The third thing is they actually the act of choosing actually brings things closer to us. It's a um, like when we when we feel like we've chosen something, we own it much more. Um, there's actually less distance. It's it's similar to distance in time and distance in space. Actually relates to the distance bias we have. When someone else owns something, it, you know their choice, it feels far away. When we've chosen something, it actually feels closer to us in a similar way as if it was uh, close to us in time and space. It's kind of the third variable in distance bias in the seeds model for those of you who, who, who know that work. So anyway, so, so it's all these different points. And then finally, we will tend to choose things that are ongoingly motivating um, versus one off, right? So when, when we're given the choice, we get a reward at the moment that keeps going, right? We're more likely to choose something beneficial that's ongoingly, um, you know, and, and there's just all these benefits, you know, continuously. So I think it's a time where we sort of, you know, at, as organizations where we sort of try and crack this challenge of how do we scale personalization <laughs> without going crazy and give everyone a hundred choices because that also doesn't work. Uh, but how do we scale personalization much, much more? Um, and, and because we've sort of tried it in, you know, some areas, why don't we try it in some others? You know, we've tried it in kind of where you work and, and, and some companies are really experimenting with when you work, but why not with who you work with, what you work on, how you work, uh, there's all sorts of different ways that we could really experiment with this. So I want to, um, I want to just kind of dig into this a little bit more. Let's start off with the with the, the the panel, and then we'll hear from some of you. What's coming up for you as you think about autonomy? Um, you know, as you think about giving people kind of more or, or more autonomy, what do we um, what do we think? Uh, you know, really uh, really can can matter here. What who wants to go first? Angel, why don't you go first? And maybe we'll hear from Dean second. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, what people work on is one of the things that I think it's been harder for people to crack. And we've started to look at doing um, like project job boards where we just say, here's a cool project. And, and people have about 20% of their time where they could get involved and do something different. And, and that idea of being able to choose what I work on, what, you know, what area of HR I'm working in, what department um, or project I'm working on has been really exciting for people. So I think, you know, it, it's something that's a little bit more difficult to crack, but not impossible, but you've got to give space for it. You gotta, you've got to give space for people to be able to pick and choose different things to work on. And then I, I think the other thing I would say here is, you know, there's a lot of autonomy. I think that people uh, that, well, at least in my organization that people have already had, but they're so used to kind of this, standard way of operating they don't even really embrace that autonomy so in terms of where they work from or you know that that's been around for a long time people have been able to work flexibly and so i think there's also this role modeling and really touting that and saying it louder and more clearly so people really can embrace that that's also right. necessary right maybe role modeling it i mean we always have to remember that even a really positive change that is rolled out in a company about 25 percent of people actively campaign against it uh, even something that would be good for them. So no matter what you do, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Um, no matter what you do, you're still going to have about a quarter of people literally fight you on it, even if it's good for them. So you just got to kind of, you know, keep that in mind. Let's go to Dean. Dean had some really good comments on autonomy that that really uh, kind of hit hit home. Uh, let's go and let's hear a little bit of what, uh, what Dean had to say. Over to you, Dean. You know, in this time when there are so many options around how we work, and the future work that have been opened up. And we're all rethinking this and, and likely many of those lead to a, a lot more autonomy um, around kind of the works and decisions we make around it every day. And what's been more, what's been incredibly clear to me as, as we have more autonomy or we allow more autonomy is that you really have to double down on mission and values. When, when mission, when everyone's super clear about mission and super clear about what the company stands for and doesn't stand for, then they can make independent decisions around where they live or how they work or, or the work that they do. Or um, I, <laughs> There's a, a great example recently. I don't know if you may have seen on social media, but one of our designers at some point decided to, on the back of a tag, right vote the assholes out and if you flip the tag on a pair of our and he thought it was funny and appropriate and completely in line with our mission and values on a pair of stand-up shorts um that you flip the tag and it says vote the assholes out so he said hey i'm gonna put this on the back of the shorts talk to his manager and manager's like okay and it went out no no one no one approved it 
um, n- didn't go to the executive team as a marketing campaign. It just showed up virally. We were like, oh, wow, this is, we, we were seeing it to some extent when many of you were seeing it. And the, the point of that is um, this designer was crystal clear about our values. It was crystal clear about our mission and the work that we're doing and can make decisions like that that are applauded in the company, not like, why didn't he get this approved? So, um, and, you know, the, the more autonomy you allow, the more you're going to have to double down on your mission and your values and, the, and the, the clarity and understanding of those across the whole company. Fantastic story. Um, and uh, the autonomy that people have to do something, you know, that's, that's highly, you know, charged in, in some contexts is, is, is amazing. And I think the Dean's comment is that the clearer you are, uh, the more clarity you have about your values, um, the easier it is for, for people to have autonomy and, and the more they'll do the, you know, the right things by the brand. Um, I think that's a really important call out. Bex, do you want to weigh in on this one? Um, how do we make autonomy a bigger part of our organizations overall? I know Netflix has gone way further than many, many firms already in this, but, but how, how are you guys thinking about this going forward? Yeah, we're firm believers of freedom and responsibility. And I think fundamentally autonomy is about trust and how much you trust your employees. Um, And if you look at a lot of systems and processes in organization, I believe that they manage to the minority and they manage that it's, you know, we could give people freedom, but what if somebody does X? And to Dean's point, most people, if you set the right context and you set the right expectations of norms of behavior, will behave in that way. And there always will be a minority. So I think when we're looking at autonomy and where we can give autonomy, the Trade-offs that we need to consider are not what's the risk if we have no expense policy and we say to people, you can spend the organization's money as if it's your own. What not the risk of, well, there's going to be some people that overspend. The risk is what's the challenge in tying up the rest of the organization and the 99% of people who won't overspend in bureaucracy and process and lack of autonomy. Um, the same applies to things like dress codes. The same, we don't have a holiday policy. The holiday policy at Netflix or vacation policy is take vacation. And largely, I've never come across anybody that's taken too much vacation because there's norms and people are high achievers and, and want to do well. But the bureaucracy, the trade off of put, tying people up in bureaucracy and reducing the autonomy actually isn't worth it if a couple of people take six weeks of holiday. Um, And so I think it's really about, I'd encourage people to really think about like, what are you losing by not giving autonomy? And are you really making that trade off? It's really interesting, you know, having a ton of insights about that. Um, You know, we we have a word for that, it's called a safety bias. And a safety bias, it's the the final S in the seeds model. Uh, If you haven't seen that, I think there's some sessions on that today you could log into. Uh, but a safety bias is essentially where you're, you're kind of overvaluing a potential downside and having it kind of take over your thinking. Um, and I'm just having all these insights about all these different ways that companies do that. So they, they, they did that for years in performance management, right? So the, 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 you know, like we have to design a system in case people are really bad performers. And so they designed this system that was awful for most people, you know, in case the, you know, for, to, but really it was to manage two, three or 4% of people. Um, and so, so we've been, you know, we've been helping kind of eradicate that from the face of the earth as best we can. Um, there was a paper we wrote called kill your performance ratings that kind of goes into that, you know, the upside and the downside, the invisible downside of having performance ratings. Um, and, uh, I think that's in the, in, in the, the chat here, um, or in the, in the resources here, kill your performance ratings, but there's a number of other processes that, uh, I think come from this place of fear, um, where, where there is this few percent of people who will rot the system, but we don't measure the downside, as you're saying, you know, on everyone else. Um, and, you know, if humans were, you know, fundamentally unethical, you know, eBay wouldn't be a massive company, right? Airbnb wouldn't exist. Um, and, you know, humans on the whole, when given trust, you know, generally do, you know, do the right thing. Um, and I think it comes back to theory X and theory Y. Do you believe people need to be kind of unleashed or do you need, you know, need to be controlled? 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I also believe that norms have a better way of controlling behaviors than systems and processes. You know, I've worked in organizations that have had very stringent expense policies. I've still fired people for, you know, finding a way around the system. Um, and so if you can set the norms of behavior, you know, if you want people to wear their seatbelt, campaigns like saying things like nine out of 10 people wear their seatbelt are much more effective than increasing the penalties for not wearing a seatbelt. So. Mm -hmm. I think really thinking through what is the context we need to set to have people behave in the way that we think is appropriate at our organization rather than and therefore give you are able to give people more freedom to make those choices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Netflix has been a kind of standout in, in giving people autonomy. I know you've had some done some, some, some big things that other companies say that would never work here. But I, I think it can, these practices can work in many places. And I think that this is the year you know, 2020, 2021 is the year to actually treat people like humans more um, and, uh, and and see what happens just for the heck of it. Um, let's try, try treating people like humans, like you do trust them and see what happens. And yeah, you'll get a few percent of people who rot the system, but on the whole, the 90 plus percent of people will be that much more motivated. And the net effect is very big. It's just a safety bias that has you panicked about that few percent. It's just your brain. Um, it's literally just a safety bias where you're uh, you know, overcompensating for that potential risk. That's great. Some great comments. Thanks, Bex. Uh, Lynn, do you want to share a little bit of your thinking on autonomy overall, or reacting to to Dean's comments, or Bex? Anyone? Anyway? No, I, I think I think um, I think where the the where question is just the tip of the iceberg. I think employee centric um, thinking around this is really critical. Um, one of the things I'll give an example of something that we've um, we've been playing with. It's experimentation at this point. Is the how. Um, so uh, no, no, no um, surprise to any of you that we're a meeting culture. We meet a lot um, because we like seeing each other because we miss each other. Um, and at the end of the day, that can fill your calendar from you know beginning to end. Uh, so we've begun a no meeting day. Um, and just to give people the you know, more of the how back so that they can figure out you know what what they can do with their their time. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, all day long you're in a meeting, you don't get time to do the things you need to get done that you take notes from the meeting. So I think that's one of the things around how that I give you an example of how we're thinking about autonomy, but it's just the beginning, right? Yeah, it's a lot. And the employee centric concept is a really big one, like, you know, putting, putting, you know, people at the, at the heart. And that was one of the things that we, we saw in our data back in about May, June, we collected a lot of data and this was the, the sort of magic people wanted to maintain this, this human first kind of uh, philosophy. Um, and, and I think that, you know, while you, you can't just, you know, make it a complete free for all, I think that, that we can push ourselves as companies um, to, to give people a lot more, uh, a, a lot more control uh, over their, their lives and their choices. One of the things that we've been uh, talking about a lot is um, uh, it, at, a, at a team level around kind of when you work, like really give teams uh, the authority to decide on the number of synchronous hours that they need and when they should be. It's a really simple thing. Like how many hours do you need to be synchronous? You need to be online at the same time. Um, be real about that. Let the team decide and then let the team decide which those hours are and then free people up otherwise. And that one principle, if you can like operationalize that principle across every team, across the whole company, you have massively more uh, autonomy. People have a lot more time, a lot more flexibility. Now that's really the when you work, right? That's one thing, but that might be one habit that you spend kind of a month, you know, just executing across the whole company um, and kind of really get that everywhere. Maybe the next month you start to execute. All right, let's have, um, let's, let's have, you know, minimal meeting Mondays. Um, because when your brain is fresh after a weekend, you can actually do the best creative work. Um, you know, let's instill minimal meeting Monday so that you can actually have more autonomy to like work on what you need to work on versus be part of meetings. Because we are seeing that cost as well um, of kind of people not being able to do their own work. So maybe you spend a month kind of rolling out minimal meeting Mondays, right? And then maybe you spend a month rolling out um, kind of a, a, a three times rule around Zoom meetings. Sorry, Lynn. But uh, you know, after three, you you got to have your own time to catch up on stuff. At least you know fifty minutes. Um, so I think I think there's a series of these habits that kind of will give people more autonomy before we even get into some of those bigger things. But some of those bigger things, like choosing who you work with, choosing what you work on, choosing even there's been talk about choosing the intensity of a career path. Like, do you want 
a high intensity career path? Do you want a medium intensity career path? Do you want a low intensity career path? Like, tell us kind of the kind of career path you want. Choose it. Tell us. And we know like how many stretch roles to give you, how many different kinds of projects to give you, you know, all of these kinds of things. That's an interesting choice, right? Um, so I think there's some, some different ways of kind of thinking about autonomy, but even some of the very basic things, I think it's, it's time that we, we settled into the fact that at least a hybrid work world is going to be here for a while and we need to, you know, we need to do some more autonomy. Um, and it, it, it kind of brings me back to, to clarity a little bit. And we did have a quote from Dean on clarity and I, I didn't share it before, but I, I think it's pretty relevant. We might get the, the Dean quote on clarity because I think Autonomy, and in fact, Dean said this around autonomy, autonomy without kind of clarity is a, is a really difficult thing. Um, so we sort of need to work on both. Uh, let's get Dean's comment on, um, on, on clarity back up. Let's hear from Dean. There has probably been a never <laughs> a time when there's been so much uncertainty. And uh, I think it really is um, really emphasis a time when we have to communicate, over-communicate, and communicate again, and then communicate in, in the ways that people want to receive it. We found, you know, town halls, big town halls, little town halls, email, um, uh, internet, every, every form of communication, and everyone seems to connect to it in, in really different ways um, in terms of keeping people up to date, up to date. But Man, in this time, it has never probably been more more important to um, communicate and be transparent with folks. And when you think you've you've been as transparent as you can possibly be and communicated as clear as you can, um, turn the volume up like ten more in this moment um, to to help because we uh, there is just so much uncertainty. And the more you, we can create some level of clarity for what's happening at work at least people can deal with some of the uncertainties they're dealing with in the rest of, in the rest of their lives. Fantastic. Some great comments from Dean around, uh, around the importance of clarity and to give people autonomy, we're going to have to really give them a lot of clarity as well. Um, so, you know, as we think about um, the opportunity that is 2020 and 2021 and maybe beyond, as we think about this opportunity, you know, I started with, uh, if you're passionate about human change, this may be your year. Um, this may be your year to do big things. You can probably do bigger things than you ever have before. Um, and, you know, my encouragement to you is build like a one year or a two year plan for doing big things, not one big thing, but how do we really think about transforming, you know, our organizations to be better for humans uh, in this time? And how do we do that, of course, through science and data and evidence-based, not just through, you know, the, the flavor of the month, but it, it can be the time to do that. I think we need a philosophy underneath it all. And, and physics is a great place to start, um, which is, you know, choosing a place on this. Are we, are we slightly depletive and that's okay? Are we just more close to sustainable? Are we willing to bet on regenerative? Are we going to design practices, talent practices, workforce practices that actually leave people better than we found them? Um, and I encourage you to listen to the, the podcast with Dean talking about this from about a year ago to kind of get some inspiration as well. But you know, choose a place. If you want to be regenerative, don't just say it. Actually, think about all your talent practices and how do we actually develop practices that leave people better. Now, in particular, right now and for the foreseeable future, the three things we've really got to work on a lot more uh, and kind of take these much more seriously is absolutely the need for connectedness. We call it relatedness. We've really got to take seriously the need for that that sense of connection with with others and how it brings us back from the brink of overwhelm and really helps us perform and helps us uh, be sustainable. Secondly, we've got to work much harder on certainty, but through the lens of clarity uh, and help our organizations and particularly our leaders uh, to really value clarity and, and kind of teach them how to actually build that. And then thirdly, autonomy. How do we weave autonomy into our practices? And I, and I do think, and I said before, I do think autonomy is the most powerful lever because you can weave it into systems as well as habits. Um, and as you give people that greater sense of trust, that greater sense of autonomy with clarity, uh, big things can happen. So closing comments, um, Angel, Bex, Lynn, Cammy, any closing comments from you before we kind of close off as you think about building a better normal? Lynn, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, you know, David and I have had a lot of conversation around this topic over the months. And I think uh, for those companies that really embrace this 
and you know take this this uh, this horrible thing that's happening out there and turn it into a way to rethink. And I don't mean tweak; I mean revolutionize uh, your practices to the point of regeneration. Um, I think that's the companies; those are the companies that will win uh, going forward in terms of not only the work, the profitability, but and how their employees feel about um, them and and the loyalty and the trust and all of that. Yeah, and that's a good point. And revolutionary. Uh, this is a time to be uh, to be a revolutionary. And I'm sure many of us in uh, this space are quiet revolutionaries on the inside. Now it's time to stop covering and come out and uh, show your true colors and uh, be the revolutionary that you uh, always wanted to be through your you know your whole uh, your whole career. Angel, tell us uh, tell us your thoughts in closing there. Yeah, you know, I mentioned um, that that we're an industrial manufacturer. We, you know, manufacture engines and we are a technology company as well. We power things and people typically think about companies like that and say that they're kind of old and dead. And here we are like trailblazing record high stock prices, great, you know, retention. And I think it's because of these things. We've connected with our people. We've helped our people to feel more connected. We've given them freedom and space. And we've also provided clarity. And so we, when you think about these concepts for an organization that's 100 years old that lots of people would thought would be long gone to be really trailblazing, it's because we're making progress in these ways. So I, I agree with Lynn, you know, really uh, be revolutionary, adopt it, make it a part of who you are, and you'll see progress. Yeah, I love that. Thanks, Angel. Be, you know, be the revolutionary that brought you to this field. You know, if you're in talent and human development some way, I bet you there's a revolutionary inside you that's wanted to make organizations better in some way. Uh, now's the time to, to shine. Cami, any uh, closing thoughts there? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm just going to uh, echo some of the comments and, and then primary, primary lens would be to take care of the people because when we take care of the people, they will take care of our business. I think that's that should be our main lens. And sometimes we tend to, or organizations tend to feel what about the business need? What about the bottom line? But I think that let's go back to people. People are going to make sure that the bottom line is is, is trending trending upward. So yeah. people take care of business. Yeah, and you know, I know it's only an N of one, but you know, Microsoft have really done some amazing work on really caring about people. And while they're not perfect and they have challenges as any hundred thousand plus company does, uh, they're number one on the Just Capital Index, like literally the the. You know, against everyone else, the most human organization that's really working hard on that. Also one of the most valuable organizations now and doing incredibly well. So, you know, they're a great example of, you know, it is, it is worth investing in the humans, uh, obviously in N of one, but there are many, many other examples there. Bex, any closing comments? Yeah, I, like you said, David, I think that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to disrupt. And I think it's in all of our interests to treat people as treat as people and to regenerate them and to build connections, give them trust, give them freedom. And as Kami said, just enjoy the results that ensue from that. So I think that, you know, time is now um, and we should we should start thinking differently and disrupt things that we've done for the past and taken as the way that we should do things and really challenge our thinking yeah beautifully said let's go and revolutionize companies and i'm thinking about all the safety biases that are stopping these things from happening i'm gonna have to do some work on that uh, and think about all the different places where safety biases are inhibiting you know incorrectly companies from actually trusting people and that you know, there's, there's light on the other side. So look, a, a big, big, big thank you to Bex, Lynn, Cami, Angel, all of you, and Dean as well, uh, who's, who, who worked really hard to be with us, but uh, uh, we got his comments. A big, big thank you to you, big thank you to the audience and everyone behind the scenes as well. It is time to build a better normal. The next two days, we're gonna dive deep into that from many, many, many different perspectives. Hopefully you can join many of the sessions. Uh, there's some very powerful sessions coming up um, over the next couple of days. We've taken a year to build this, so uh, try and get there if you can. Uh, but just a big thank you again. Let's go and uh, revolutionize organizations and, and take advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care of yourselves and look after each other. All the best. Bye-bye.